I think the first thing I, I would like to start by saying in a funny way to sort of draw on Ari's question, who was Marianne Amache, uh, which I'll get to more in a second, is that um, I don't know if anyone in this room can answer that question. And, uh, and I think that that sort of particular form of not knowing or opacity is also a very productive uh, way of approaching her work and maybe also an important way of... Uh, she was very proud of the fact that Stockhausen referred to her as an alien. <laughs> right. Um, and I just, as like a side note before we get into it, I thought just in a funny way, um, in relation to some of the interesting talks we've heard today, maybe to have, uh, this is not something that we fleshed out because we didn't know uh, the, the detailed contents of the talks today, but something maybe to have in the backs of our minds is that uh, the sort of ways that some of these papers ended this morning, you know, with the call to uh, reclaim animism or the call to sort of um, kind of find new strategies for intervening in this sort of intercession of techno-scientific uh, apparati. Um, the, you know, those, those are very uh, large calls at the ends of these talks, which I think in a funny way, Marianne's work might be said to take up in its inception, and that in a certain way we could uh, perhaps suggest that her work sort of starts where these sort of theoretical uh, investigations ended. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, just first this uh, little slide here uh, I thought was just kind of a sweet way to begin. Uh, it's from uh, the early 70s when she's doing autoacoustic research at MIT, premature attempts to think about ways of indicating, characterizing a range of B within given intervals, part of the quote, understanding ritual, end quote, before finding approach. And in a funny way, I think that's sort of where we are uh, in relation to her work. I just have some notes here on my phone just quickly before we get into further things. Um, you know, I think that after Marianne died, that was to me one of the most striking things was the sort of uh, how little we actually really knew or understood her work and the importance of also sort of uh, admitting that, uh, not only in the sense of like the sort of limited time spans and the compartmentalization of her friendships with different people over the years. You know, Robert and I sort of knew her towards the end of her life. Uh, there, of course, are still living older friends, but who only know her in particular periods. Um, but also in the sense that I would say maybe, I don't know, 5% of her writing and audio is published, maybe. Um, things like this, so that we really, there's a huge amount that we don't know. Um, but I think that there's also sort of like, there are very sort of different forms of not knowing. There's of course this obvious sort of quantitative form, simply the lack of data, which we will hopefully correct in the next few years when materials are digitized. Um, there's a kind of, um, maybe sort of romanticized, powerless form of not knowing that certain theorists have brought up uh, in relation to her work, the sort of, the idea of sort of ephemeral irretrievability, uh, that her practice sort of died with her. And then there's a kind of not knowing that I would actually ascribe to institutions, that this kind of lack of knowledge is, is rather the sort of imposition of a particular uh, mode of knowledge upon a body of work that might have a very idiosyncratic way of knowing. And then I think though the most productive thing which I'd like to suggest and we can return to later I think is um, there was a particular form let's say of this not knowing or of uh, opacity that is actually sort of I would claim from what I've come to understand about her work sort of imminent to the work itself and to her way of thinking itself. And that's something that Robert actually in the last few days in our discussions I think uh, described very beautifully as a form of uh, intelligent sensuality or, or uh, I, I suggested maybe a sort of material intelligence. Um, uh, and that's, uh, you know, on the one hand, evidenced in a very simple way by uh, her sort of mode of working, by, you know, living in a space for a month in advance of a presentation. And, uh, you know, I, I worked with her, for example, in a, in, a, in a church in Berlin. We spent about three weeks pretty much living in that church Oh, screensaver, and um, and we would move loudspeakers, you know, a, a single foot, and then we would listen. We would move it another foot. We'd change it fifteen degrees and keep listening. This kind of this kind of process. Um, 
So there was, there was something in her actual approach and her working methodology that was a sort of reverence for the sort of inexhaustible complexity of materiality, which sort of inherently refuses forms of closure uh, in the sense of like a classical work. Um, and in, in regard to that, I thought a uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I've used this word opacity a few times. Of course, the classic text in relation to that would be Edward Glissant's Poetics of Relation, a very beautiful remark from Glissant. He says, quote, the opaque is not the obscure. It is that which cannot be reduced, which is the most perennial guarantee of participation and confluence, end quote. So I think what we would like to try to do today in this little short span of time is to sort of show what we do know and can sort of begin to say and have learned since her passing. Um, and then to sort of gesture toward what we begin to understand about this form of sort of materialist not knowing that uh, I would again argue is sort of imminent to the work itself. Um, so I think we can go through some, a bunch of images now and sort of work our way back to these sort of more conceptual issues, I think, a bit later. So here we have, and I mean, this is also, I think we thought this was important to show these, a lot of these details because uh, I think very few people have seen uh, this kind of stuff. So this is, this is the house that she moved into in the early 80s. Uh, this is actually a very recent photo. This was taken in May. You can see this uh, red thing. I think this is actually indicating that the house has been condemned. Um, that's maybe a whole other uh, story, and the, the the story of the house. It's probably is safer now than it was. Exactly. It's it's being uh, repaired at the moment. Robert, though, um, we really have Robert to thank for the existence of the archive in the sense that uh, when Marianne had a, had a head injury uh, in 2009 in the summer, which then led to a series of strokes, uh, and she was then in the hospital for, I think, at least three months before she passed away. Yeah, it was very touch and go, a lot of that, too. Um, and during that period, Robert then, uh, who was uh, her medical proxy, so was taking care of her, visiting her in the hospital, uh, also began the sort of really incredibly uh, strenuous and rigorous process of boxing the materials in the house and, and um, organizing Well, what things. happened was is that she had, uh, she had had a head injury that we didn't really understand the extent of it uh, at Bard campus. And she fell and hurt her head, and she was found, you know, basically near this pipe, I think. So um, we didn't really know uh, how much damage there was. Uh, I don't know if any of you know anybody who have had a head injury. It's often hard to assess what the extent of it is. So she was uh, in various hospitals, uh, moved around, uh, put into a, a special center for people with uh, head trauma, which is near, where, in, near Kingston. And then um, she'd had a, a really bad stroke. And on the, before that, there was talk about her, she wanted to go home, she might have been able to be rehabilitated. But at, when that became clear she would never walk again, um, then the, uh, it's like, well, you know, Maybe she could still work, you know. We, I, I could talk to her. So uh, she, she could have a conversation. And so, so, I mean, just to sort of interject briefly, just like what this is showing is like the, the state of the house as, uh, as it was at this moment that Robert's described. Yeah, so what I did is I thought, okay, so this, we got to save her work, save her work for her and so that she could continue to work as an invalid. So I went on Amazon.com and I bought a super wide angle lens for my digital camera and went all through the house. She had been away for uh, several months and the house had been sealed. It was a very rainy uh, a year, so it was starting to get kind of dank in there. So I went and I just photographed everything as it was. Uh, and the intent to that was, is like, oh, you know, I wanna, you know, she could sit at a laptop and find where everything was. And then I went to a local moving company and I bought 200 of the exact same boxes. And uh, you know, every day I was seeing her in her hospital, uh, sometimes two or even three times a day, I'm trying to catch every nursing shift, and going to the house and then I would photograph, let's say a desk uh, or something, and all the materials on it. And then I would box, open a box, you know, tape the box open, you know, form the box, put the stuff in there like this. <laughs> And then um, take, a, take a shot of what was in the box, 
seal the box, and then date it, and with a sequence of how many bo what box that was for that day. And the idea was is that there'd be a one-to-one -one mapping between what the contents of each box to where it was in her house. So she would have a sense of being able to work. That was the intention. So it wasn't really about archiving, it was about enabling her to continue to work. Uh, under a lot of pressure, you know, there was no money to do this, and uh, you know, I, I was also working with her in the hospital, so. Uh, and I mean, you also have to say that Robert was like doing incredible things, like oh, maybe you can even see here a little bit. There's things that were water damaged, things in really bad condition, and Robert was painstakingly drying things, separating crumpled things. Oh, I was wearing a respirator. I mean, it was the house was in quite a quite dismal shape. Um, and I mean, although as Robert is saying, it, this was not initially conceived as an archival sort of uh, topography. Uh, after the fact, it's now proven an incredibly effective way of accessing the materials in the sense that, you know, if we're looking for a, a piece from the city links and we have a single document in one box, we can open up Robert's photographic record and see that, okay, these three shelves in this room contained these files and we can then very readily uh, find uh, additional materials. I think materials. if in retrospect someone told me about this, I wouldn't have known it was possible. The fact that I didn't know what I was doing, but I was methodical. I think worked out well. Um. Yes, and so, yeah, so that's just the boxing process. Then we have a little bit of the archive, um, which is a, a space in the same town as uh, Amish I lived in, in Kingston, New York, about an hour and a half, two hours from New York City. Um, and we have a, 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 an okay room. It's, it's attached to a storage facility. Um, but it's a little bit of a step up from an actual storage unit. It's a temperature controlled room there's with power, a, there's, power yeah, with, there's a heat. Pri with a private entrance and, and, and such. This is sort of this, the early phases of it, really when the materials are being moved in. And this is, I think, very recent from something like December or something like that. There are, as Robert said, there are around 200 boxes. I'd say at least 50 of those are uh, some form of audio, mostly reel-to-reel -reel tape. About 100 of them are um, various forms of printed material, texts, photos, uh, you know, concert programs. The tape on the boxes is the information, you know, the sequence, and then the writing, the printing, the blueprinting is the name of the moving company. The boxes right. are cheaper if they have the advertising on it. So. Right, and it's also, of course, um, I think maybe we didn't mention is that the, the, I don't know if you can read them, but the letters that precede the date of boxing on all of the boxes refer to the rooms they were found in. So like the the archive itself becomes this kind of micro topology of the house and it's organized as well by room, so they're all sort of together and in order. Um, let's see, we also have, um, you can see a little bit, the sort of imaging station that we have for uh, digitizing uh, printed matter. That's and a copy stand and uh, early on, uh, I, I had worked on some animated films so I was, I was sort of in the idea of like, you know, sitting up, standing up and, you know, moving things around and stuff. And the copy stand mode made a lot more sense because if you have materials that aren't flat or even have a slight contour or they're kind of irregularly shaped, the copy stand is, um, is, is a lot more flexible and I think faster. Oh, very much so. I mean, so in the last year, I was uh, I spent a good amount of time working in this archive and sort of organizing it. And um, what we can say that it's done in the archive is that we now, for the first time, have a complete inventory. I think I have some images of the beginning and ending of our, and it's a very simple Excel table at the moment, a sort of finders list that has, I think at the moment, around 3,500 entries. Um, it's still a rather uh, low resolution granularity, but Does anybody know what a finder's list is? It's just, it's a list of the contents of the box. It's something I had to learn about too. It's something, because I didn't know, but basically it's a list of the contents and it's kind of indexed, so you know, it makes it much easier to reference what's, what's in there. There's kind of stages to this. Like the first level was like securing the material, boxing it. And then the second one was going through and cataloging and getting this finders list for all the boxes. And uh, in terms of media, we have notebooks and printed materials. We have a lot of tape. We have a lot of quarter-inch tape. 
we have some video, we have some cassettes, uh, we have some floppy disks, uh, we have some DVDs. Um, yeah, and I mean like a lot of the time-based media are things that we've not been able to transfer, in particular the older audio, uh, a lot of which is in quite fragile condition and needs would need special um, treatment, but what we did manage to achieve in the last year using this copy stand that you saw before, um, there's a sort of even a little bit lower resolution in terms of completeness, uh, complete pass of printed matter in the archive. So I think I did around 15,000 uh, scan photo things at that copy stand last year. So we have like a sort of at least working overview for kind of complete written materials and sort of working notes. And the next big project will of course be the, the tapes. Um, there's some, uh, how much acetate tapes are, you know, has that been surveyed? Because there's stuff from the 60s is on acetate base. Mm -hmm. And then you get into the 70s and that's when you get mylar and then you get this sort of tricky area, very tricky area. Sure, the things that need to be baked and um, there are also, I mean, there are also tapes that are unfortunately moldy and there's, there's all kinds of issues. So we all got, got excited when we were talking about tapes in the previous lecture. It's like, oh, yes. <sighs> Yeah, um, and then I thought, well, let's see, what do we have now is um, a little bit, just a sort of quick survey of the sort of materials that we've had that we've just been sketching out. I mean, these are just some tapes. Um, Robert mentioned, uh, these are, uh, I guess, beta audio. Um, really, the, that's one of the sort of, I think, sort of archival, musicological issues that we face is that she tried to sort of keep up with whatever the current generation of uh, storage medium was, but never in an entirely consistent way. So there are many copies of potentially the same thing in different generations and different formats, um, but never entirely overlapping. Um, this, uh, I think Robert mentioned as well that there's video, this is something that's maybe not quite as well known about her work, is that she did produce quite a bit of video as well as sort of components of her architecturally staged inter, uh, installations. Uh, a lot of it was made in the 80s in, um, in Berlin when she had the DAD residency. Um, there's sometimes also, for example, uh, I don't know, I, 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 thinking of a particular installation in Berlin in a, in a single room in a church, there were, for example, four small monitors that had these sort of pulsating images a little bit in the line with the sort of ear tones that we heard last night, but in a visual sense. Um, let's see, oh, there's all kinds of memorabilia like this. This is a very sweet photo of uh, her with her parents in Renovo, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is, um, Oh, yeah, this is sort of her f the first work that she got sort of widespread recognition for uh, when she was a fellow at the, um, oh, what's it called, this institute in Buffalo, the sort of very renowned place that Lucas Foss ran in the 60s. And um, she did a very large scale work there called In City, which was 28 hours long, and there were multiple locations around Buffalo where there were different performances from different artists happening, and she had live radio, at that point I think it was radio uh, hookup that she was mixing in the radio studio for 28 hours. Um, this is a oh, yeah, sort of a nice picture uh, of her also in Buffalo. This is of course Cornelius Cardew. And I think one of these gentlemen in a suit is uh, Lucas Foss. I'm not sure exactly who they all are, though. Um, uh, oh yeah, um, this is also a very particular uh, work, an example of the sort of quite rare scores that we have. This was the last, uh, an example of a page from the last fully scored work she made uh, in 1967, which was uh, called Adjacencies for Two Percussionists and Live Electronics. Uh, that was uh, performed in Carnegie Hall. And um, I think one can see sort of the influence of sort of Stockhausen's notations from that period who she had studied with in 1964 uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, she was uh, in sort of complex ways uh, unsatisfied with the performance of it, but wrote sort of extensively about it in a sort of productive way that sort of led into this new phase of her work. Uh, but she did entirely abandon instrumental music after this. I knew her about 10 years and she never mentioned this to me. That's an example of the compartmentalization that Bill referred to. Um, 
So we found a score that was sort of a startling thing. Well, and beyond that, I mean, you know, as a sort of maybe a transition to the next images that will come, uh, something that I think I don't have in here, uh, she made a series of six notebooks around this time, the late 60s, mid to late 60s, early 70s, uh, which she, to me, like sort of anecdotally referred to as her self-psychoanalysis of her sort of musical uh, or sonic tastes, expectations. And so I think in the wake of creating this kind of more typically new music-y, uh, classical-esque work, uh, she really w tried to um, take apart all of her assumptions about how she hears. And so these notebooks, for example, are about very, uh, I think as she says, elemental parameters of sound. There's one on, or I think there are actually two on timbre, there's one on duration, there's one on intonation, um, where she really is working through in various ways um, how she can understand these things. Um, uh, this is just a sort of sweet thing, but it's uh, chronologically functions at this time. Uh, this is, these are also things that we don't know a ton about. Um, around 1968, she had a fellowship uh, at the University of Illinois in uh, Champlain, or in Urbana, sorry, where, of course, uh, Laren Hiller was working at that time, and Cage, of course, in 68, was doing harpsichord there. And that was uh, the first that she met Cage. And uh, Cage, I think, at that time had just won some kind of award, and uh, the story that she told was that Cage was so impressed and excited by her that he immediately wrote her a check for $100. And uh, what's even more charming, though, is that um, for the, maybe for the next 10 years, in all of her uh, grant applications, of which there are many, she would include a, a copy of this check from Cage as a kind of letter of recommendation. <laughs> Well, he did an acrostic of, that about I think her, I too. Have her too. Yeah. Uh, this is just a, another sort of, I'll try to go quickly with the anecdotal things, but this is kind of an interesting image that comes from uh, a book that Georgi Kepish edited uh, in the, from MIT Press. Um, this is moving into that phase in the early 70s. Uh, she was then in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and had a, a series of fellowships at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. Um, but sort of leading right into that moment, she was involved with this uh, environmental art collective called Pulsa, um, the story of which is a little, a little bit unclear to me. And in any case, in this Kepish catalog, there's a long article about Pulsa, um, and just by chance, Marianne, she's uncredited in the book, of course, happens to be sitting with them there. Uh, a few nights ago, and some, I'm sure people here also saw this, but Serge Cherapin was posting some photos on Facebook, also from this period uh, when she was staying at the Harmony Ranch, the Pulsa compound in Connecticut. Her birthday was just a couple of days ago, and I think that might have triggered this yeah. nostalgia burst. Oh, yeah, this is just the uh, sort of entering the Center for Advanced Visual Studies period. There are a number of publications from that time, not, not really particularly helpful things, but sort of catalogs that include her work. Um, and this period is, a really, is sort of a wonderful sort of heroic image. Um, Boston Harbor, right? at the Boston Harbor, and this is sort of the period where her City Links series, which maybe is one of her most sort of renowned series, starts, or uh, actually the, this work in City that I described before in Buffalo is officially City Links number one, but there's a gap between that in 1967 and then I think 1972 when the next work starts. Um, and this is on the, the, the pier in Boston Harbor where for four years she had a microphone installed and had a live a uh, high quality telephone link to her studio, a 24 hour monophonic feed. Well, the story she told me was that it was originally gonna be so many months and then the phone company never shut her off. <laughs> so she had it like way longer. And um, I think it was in 2010, there was a, a, a you know, memorial at MIT and a friend of hers, Keiko Prince and I, we went over to this exact spot and um, it was really haunting because it sounded the same. You know, it's kind of funny to think about sonic features enduring, particularly kind of an industrial working area, like for 40 years, particularly now. But uh, at least to me, I'm sure if I showed up with a Zoom or something, I'd find all these artifacts. But And it's, it's maybe an interesting moment to sort of return to this thought that I was mentioning at the opening of, of sort of her... 
uh, the sort of rigor of material intelligence that she developed as a kind of methodology. Because I, I, as far as I understand, having this sort of four year long feed in her studio was also a really uh, incredible, um, or I, if I were to characterize it, I would describe it maybe as the time where she sort of taught herself to listen uh, uh, in the way that informed a lot of her later work. Do you remember what note? She had a score and she had, there was a fundamental note for the harbor. Yeah, you know I don't remember offhand, yeah. And New York Harbor was different, it had a different fundamental. <laughs> right. Um, and the interesting thing about this sort of way of listening that she developed there is in, in many interviews and lectures at the time, she emphasizes really vehemently, like almost aggressively, that she was never interested in the sounds of water, she was never interested in the sound of boats, never interested in the sound of birds, she was not at all interested in field recording, but rather she was interested in the sort of um, perceptual geography of the approach and, and sort of recession of objects in and out of the sort of sonic field. And what's so interesting about that thought though is that of course the feed she's receiving is, is mono. So the sort of spatial information that's being transmitted through the mono feed is, is entirely timbral. And I think that connects really interesting to her later um, uh, sort of architecturally staged installations where you know, she would have speakers that were so carefully placed throughout an entire building, but the signal that might be going through all of the speakers at once would perhaps be mono <laughs> or at maybe stereo. Um. Uh, this, is, oh, this is kind of, a, these are nice uh, Polaroids that we found recently. What's interesting about them I'm not sure which one you can best see, but these boxes that are on the wall in the back are the actual device that she was receiving the CityLink's feed through. And this is at her studio at MIT. Uh, we have, I think, one of those boxes yeah. in the archive as well. The actual like, receiver. And stuff like that just doesn't, you know, you know, people don't save those things. You're not going to find like dozens on eBay, you know. I, uh, this is, um, these are a little bit hard to see. Um, a sort of example of sort of how then she would uh, install some of these um, feeds. This is from a show I think at the Haydn Gallery at MIT called Intervention. It's all unreadable, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's a show that I think, I think, I'm trying to think if this is like the show, I think maybe Robert Smithson was in this show, I forget all who were in it. Um, she had this very strange box, and you can't see any of this, this is sort of a disaster, but um, in the box, her partner, friend, collaborator at the time, Luis Frangella, had made this sort of 3D uh, image, and the speaker was actually embedded inside the pedestal there. Um, but again, these are partially mysterious things to us. They're, um, because I've never seen these before, by the way. Okay. No. Uh, Bill did something really heroic and he moved into the archive for like, what, three months last year. So, um, you know, we've gone fits and stages. So, I, you know, there were a lot of things that were in files and things I've never seen. And this is new to me, so. But again, like, you know, because, because of, as I was saying before, like her emphasis that she's not interested in like the bird sounds or the, these kind of things, there are actually very few documents of these city links works because she was not interested in documenting, you know, the sort of morphology of whatever the, the current moment of the feed was. She was sort of interested in how she could potentially install that feed and sort of what kind of um, other information one can sort of draw out of it. So what this may have sounded like no idea. Uh, this, again, we're just sort of doing this little survey. Um, the material that we, uh, the sort of research material that we showed last night in the museum um, was generated through these uh, Tridex Muse synthesizers that her friend and collaborator Marvin, Muse, uh, Marvin Minsky designed. Um, yeah, just sort of images of them. Um, yeah, she did like these uh, ear tone studies with um, them and I, I when there was a kind of a tirage process in terms of trying to save her work, there was, um, you know, we didn't know how long, you know, I mean, she was ill, so I was constantly having to run back and forth to the hospital, catch every nursing shift, and then, you know, the focus was on saving her writings and her tapes. Gear was a very low priority. Um, and, uh, but we got some in. I didn't know what the hell these things were. In fact, um, they were kind of on this table uh, covered with posters and things, so I pulled them out. And um, just a few
few weeks. Oh, Bill, Bill was playing them with them in the summer, and then I, I was working with them. They're basically kind of, they could qualify as the first retail, commercial, available personal computer, except that they were designed to make music. So the sliders there don't really correspond to notes. This area here, these sliders are for pitch and tempo and volume and that type of thing, but everything that's going on up there is actually completely digital. So if you put the slide in some point, it doesn't necessarily correspond directly to a note. I mean, if you want to make uh, like, uh, you know, like a, the, a seventh, you know, you have to actually make a binary seven. You know, so it's, you, you're actually working in binary the whole thing. There's a, there's a top area, about you know, eight registers. I think it's marked C, and then below that, it's uh, B from one to 31, and that, th those are settings in a shift register. And the manual says you can make a composition that won't repeat until like 30 years. Uh, that's on one machine. If you hook them together, I haven't computed, but uh, you could basically make probably a piece that goes on for 20, 30,000 years. So this is 1973. But I mean, the interesting thing too about them is that although those things are all super interesting, Marianne's use of them was entirely against the grain. Um, I mean, in this period when she's at MIT, as I was sort of saying, as I would sort of characterize it as sort of learning to listen in her particular way, learning to sort of formalize what she had already perhaps discovered in her earlier compositions in terms of psychoacoustics, um, I think in a certain sense what was maybe almost more important for her here were the sort of, um, just sort of stable pitch generating uh, possibilities here so that she could investigate these sort of evoked autoacoustic emission phenomena. Well, I, w I was surprised just when I found out about how it was encoded. I mean, I would think this is like the worst thing you'd possibly use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, um, but, and then to some degree, I don't think she really knew how they operated because some of the settings are in between and it makes no sense on a binary device. Um, so she was kind of bending these. And uh, I think she just like came in with, um, pure kind of fiddling around, but again, had a very specific objective that she was trying to um, reach. And when she talked about the bone difference, that was in the recording we had, did she use that term, or the mm -hmm. bone tone? Yeah. Um, that, that's an actual effect of uh, one of the, one, there's different order, um, um, difference tones, and I think that would be order one. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, it's not occurring in the brain, it's, it has to do with the shearing, uh, Nonlinear shearing in the hairs of the cochlea. So um, that's what she, that she's she's working on a very specific effect. Mm -hmm. And it's also like I think it, we, we in our little introductions last night, as we sort of mentioned too, it's extremely extensively and precisely documented. These 18 tapes of experiments with these, each is accompanied by like an entire notebook where she's writing down all of the settings and then both the sort of physiological and psychoacoustic. Uh, her own personal sort of response. She was also very things. aware of issues of habituation, mm -hmm. and maybe that's one reason she was attracted to these things, rather than just a simple oscillator. Right. Let's see, what do we have next? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's more legible up there. Um, just getting through the 70s a little bit more, uh, another form of sort of psychoacoustic phenomenon that she used, um, what she referred to as the after sound, is sort of the primary, Acoustic feature of the music she did for Merce Cunningham's Taurus. Um, and this is actually sort of like the full title of the piece. It's quite an elaborate title that refers to um, this uh, Hollis Frampton te text, a stipulation of terms from the maternal Hopi. Um, in um, Remainder, her piece for Taurus, sort of the thing that happens repeatedly in the work is that these uh, particular sort of clusters of, of sine waves will sort of move in and out uh, above and below the, the uh, threshold of audibility in such a way that, and, and as Robert said, sort of, they're sort of playing with habituation so that you have like perhaps a stable harmony, a stable pitch that lasts for several minutes, and, but just on the threshold of audibility and then it will very, very slowly fade out. And she was very interested in then in the sort of narrative or sort of trajectory of pitch events throughout this piece. And she claimed, uh, I don't think it's in this text, but somewhere else maybe, that um, 
sight of the sort of lingering psychoacoustic trace of a previous sound remains within your mind or ear for uh, up to eight minutes. I'm sure you refer to that as the after sound. And this entire work is kind of structured around that, except for uh, one section towards the end of the piece where it sort of breaks into very loud uh, ear tones. Uh, yeah, this is also uh, the, the work with Cunningham was very close to her uh, in time to her work with Cage. Uh, she did two large scale collaborations with Cage. This is the only photo we have of them together. Um, uh, one on his lecture on the weather, a uh, piece for 12 vocalists and electronics, uh, which is a shorter work uh, that I think is from 76. And then he commissioned her to make the sound component for a much more, uh, oh yeah, this is the poster from the premiere of that at Harvard. Um, he commissioned her, Marianne, to do the sound component for the complete version of Empty Words, the sort of eight hour uh, text sound composition that he made. And um, her work is also, it has a separate title, it's called Close Up, it's an independent work. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of strange story. There, these sort of mysteries sort of start to abound with her in the sense that they performed it several times in the US and in uh, uh, Europe. And there were very, very concrete documented plans to release uh, the voice and sound versions together. And for uh, whatever reason, this didn't happen. But in one of these boxes, I forget exactly which box, we uh, seems to just be sitting there prepared to uh, be released. This was not uncommon. Uh, when we first started hanging out, uh, I met her in Chicago in the late, late 90s. And then uh, I moved out to Kingston to visit her and actually lived with her for about, in, in her house for about a month, two months. Um, worked on her plumbing. <laughs> that was usually how it worked instead of rent anyway. Um, but she talked, told me about how she'd been approached by Nonesuch to do an album and how she ref you know, refused that because LP technology was not up to snuff to what she was about. And uh, as I was packing these materials, I, I ran across this letter basically saying, we love the demo, it was from Nonesuch. And uh, I had no idea that there was a demo. And then we find that we, we didn't, beyond the demo, we found the, the uh, I mean, unfortunately, unmiss, unmixed studio masters of the entire album, which are also sitting there, um, which is from 68. I mean, that would have been such an interesting moment for her to release this work. We also have, I have to say, no idea what this work from that period would have sounded like. Uh, I think some of it, if I remember correctly, was perhaps recorded at the Harmony Ranch, this Pulsa compound, um, but what that was, I really can't say at all. And that is also the problem is because it's not mixed down. How do you know what to do with that? Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure it will be interesting, uh, an interesting project to get into regardless. Um, I think if, if she had any kind of instrument, you could call her an instrument, that would be the mixing board. Mm -hmm. um, this is what Robert referred to earlier. This is the misostic that uh, Cage wrote in her name. He actually wrote, I think, two. There's a shorter one that he did, uh, sort of in an odd context, uh, like a like a Cunningham Company promotional publication <laughs> on her name, uh, but this this one was separate. Uh, she was quite close to Cage. They uh, up until his death, uh, they maintained a kind of friendship, and I think that was it. Was also a friendship that was tried in in various ways. Um, when certain of her large products would collapse, she would often turn to him for support, and uh, yeah, it was, it was sort of a sweet relationship, I think. Um, oh yeah, okay, so then just there were sort of main later bodies of work, uh, sort of work groups, work series. Uh, this is a document from um, this Teatro Municipal in Caracas in Venezuela. In the late 70s, she was touring with the Cunningham Company doing this piece, Tours, that, um, or Remainder, as we showed before. And the anecdote that she tells is that the situation in this theater um, uh, was was really kind of quite terrible for that work, and they had these really bad, old, clunky speakers. And so, and in a sort of like act of desperation at the last minute, she uh, put the speakers in very, very unusual positions. I think on one of the upper balconies, pointing out of the hallway. 
And for her, this was a kind of revelatory moment because she's, for the first time, had this sort of very intensive experience of sort of substrate-born uh, sound transmission that the, the sound was, as you were hearing it in the hall, was actually sort of being filtered through the sort of wood of the architectural... Architectural-born sound. Yeah. Yeah, which became a kind of big thing with her work. Uh, and what it's the opening into what she would then call Music for Sound Joined Rooms series, which is a series that she did uh, in Japan, Europe, uh, and the North America, uh, in various places. Um, this is, uh, well, I don't know how helpful that is to see, but another one of, I think the first official one of that series was a piece called Living Sound Patent Pending and from 1980 that she did in the New Music America Festival in Minneapolis in the empty mansion of Dennis Russell Davies, uh, in which she positioned loudspeakers throughout the you know four floors of this huge mansion. But there were also many visual components, these kind of petri dishes with... Um, Around that time, there was a famous legal case where uh, an organism that would actually eat uh, oil to, to contain oil slicks was patented. And um, I, I can't pronounce it. It's a very long name, the, the, the Panton Grantee. But um, that was kind of a big event that was important to her. So uh, that's why it's called patent pending. Well, I think that the thing that excited her is that, that maybe the patent came actually a few days, that publicly was announced a few days after her performance, that she was maybe aware of it, but she... Um, it was in the news, and how they would weigh in on it was, right. uh, was up in the air. So uh, she could have changed it to patented, but it was patent pending when she approached it. Oh, yeah, and this is this is sort of moving into uh, very quickly after that is when she started making these uh, architecturally staged entire building-based works. Um, I think what became very clear to her very quickly is that what that sort of necessitated, uh, if you don't have a fixed audience, a fixed uh, listening position, it, 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 it necessitates necessitates a kind of. Uh, reflection on uh, returning to thinking about narrative in a very kind of expanded sense and also a sort of listening choreography. And so um, one of the sort of earliest entries into that sort of realm of reflection in that period is what she called the mini sound series, which she explicitly relates to the uh, television miniseries format at that time like Dallas. Uh, and she would do uh, a series of these sort of architecturally staged events. This photo comes from the Cap Street Project, uh, I think in like 84 or something like this in San Francisco, where she did, I think over a course of two or maybe three weeks, uh, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, episodes. Uh, it would literally be like, you know, what happens when sound A meets sound B come on Friday and then sound C comes in at the end and it will be continued the next day. and. It's a bit of a silly way to describe it, but uh, I think in the sort of more abstract terms of her sort of architectural staging of sound, this was a very effective procedure for uh, mobilizing the audience and sort of mobilizing a different form of listening. She had not mentioned to me any of this stuff uh, when I, I mean, I knew about the Cap Street thing, but uh, when I was saving her stuff on the second floor, she had this kind of guest room, and I found all these papers that were a special kind of storyboard paper with like television screens, where you you know a pattern, pattern, television screen pattern, and uh, that was for storyboarding, uh, uh, you know, television. So um, was it Amy Simony that found out? Uh, this is a friend of ours who did some research at Penn, and found out that when she went to uh, undergraduate program there. She'd actually taken a class on, on television writing and production, which we had no idea, you know, and that, that kind of flips things around a lot. So Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, and also in this series, this is also from the Cap Street Project, um, the sort of objects and visual components started to become more and more important in the late 70s, early 80s. In this case, I mean, she was obviously, this was just a posed photo for like, you know, an advertisement or something, but one of the centerpieces of the installation was a replica of Freud's couch. Um, and, 
in the later years, at least in my discussions with her, when she would talk about the objects, using the use of sort of objects and videos, she also um, thought of as a way of a further means of sort of choreographing the audience. That if there were, you know, a position in that corner where a particular sound was particularly interesting at a particular moment, she might put a TV monitor over there to sort of draw an audience member at a particular time to go over there. And I think that also reflects a, a, a kind of, well, a, a reversal of the positioning of what, who's actually making the music, who's primary in a performance. And for her, that was a listener. And um, it was not just a matter of, you know, playing a, a, a listener's or interacting with a listener's uh, um, auto acoustics uh, features in their in their ears or their brain, but also their their psychoacoustics and their psychology, and their visual stuff. And uh, I think that the auto acoustics is more clearly uh, noted. Um, it's a little bit hard with these visual components, and that's that's something that we have to dig through to figure out. But I think this is really important what Robert is saying about this sort of uh, inversion of the sort of uh, artistic scene in the sense of the listener being sort of almost primary. And that ties to many things. It ties to this question of central intelligibility, as Roland Barthes said, that I was sort of trying to talk about at the beginning, but also to her relationship with Cage, uh, who she really, really uh, took very, very seriously. And I, in a somewhat speculative way, would really suggest that Marianne is maybe one of the few very authentically post-Cagean composers in the sense that she understood the silent piece, four minutes, 33 seconds, not as this kind of like terminus as it's like normally described in a lot of art historical accounts, but rather as this moment of sort of inversion where the listener becomes the sort of um, primary actor or actant. So, so if you take that approach, it's opening up a vast new area, sort of like, and it's crazy in a way with 433 because I think it's normal gesture is thought as some sort of sonic ready-made. Ready which, you know, she wasn't thinking that way at all. No, no, and for her, this, this thing of like making listening primary, she, in many, many texts throughout, really, probably starting in the 60s and up until her death, she says that her work is not about what you hear, but how you hear it. And she will write in capital letters, underlined multiple times, that her work is about ways of hearing or ways of listening, um, and not necessarily uh, particular sound. This also, uh, you know, there are a couple of things I remember her saying pretty early on. Hating composition, hating notes, which gets confused here. We're showing you scores and things like that. These were, I think, statements made to sort of shatter a lot of conceptions. But um, the idea of creating new per perceivings, perceptions, new, new perceptive geographies, new uh, compositional intelligences, uh, was much more interesting. So there was a remove from the object and the, 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 the dynamics, the normal power dynamics of music, and also a remove from, uh, in, in sort of the usual dreary metagame around music, which is, uh, seems to ebb and flow in stages of retardation. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I think, I mean, we, um, there's a little segment at the end where I'd like to read some quotations somewhere that we've read, so I'll maybe speed up a tiny bit so that we have some more time for questions, but just to, just this last image and this are both from a mini sound series she did in 87 in Berlin when she, when she was a guest of the Berlin Artist Program of the DAD. And this is just a very odd thing that I personally like, uh, what she called the pop murals that were part of this installation. And these were unfortunately uh, thrown away after the... Um, after the duration of the show. Um, yeah, so this is now jumping into the 90s a little bit. That's some 80s stuff. Um, another sort of mysterious case, she was commissioned, and here it says in 93, to write a string quartet for the Kronos Quartet. Uh, she works on it, I think, for around eight years. And for her, again, as I said before, she stopped uh, doing instrumental music in 1967. So for her, the idea of returning to instrumental music was a major, major thing. And basically, she, uh, in this concept summary here, uh, she just decided that she sort of had to reinvent instrumental music 
uh, from the ground up in order to do this string quartet. And so she has this concept of endotonality and this particular relationship between the string quartet, the electronics, and the listener as the listener as this kind of not interface point between the um, string quartet and the electronics. And there's extensive material, um, I mean, from sketches like this to like fully notated uh, things. Um, there's also maybe not extensive, but quite a bit of correspondence with the Kronos Quartet, where you know she says like, "How did you like the rehearsal score?" and things like this. And um, but uh, for whatever reason, um, oh yeah, here here's actual here's from the New York Times an actual advertisement where it's mentioned uh, as being part of their uh, concert program that year, uh, but it was never performed, and we don't know why or what happened. Um, and in the 90s, it seems we're a little bit of a difficult decade for her. Uh, more and more things like that. Uh, and towards the end of her life, there actually started to be then a series of uh, really very fascinating, interesting, but entirely unrealized works. Um, the, one of the later texts, uh, it's like a sort of product, uh, sorry, uh, not product, project proposal for a whole new sort of series is called Rare and Unusual Atmospheres. And um, it's based on, in very different ways, a lot of the components that she proposes uh, have to do with um, sort of mapping um, the acoustic characteristics of one particular acoustic space onto another. So for example, here, I think that this is, um, this is a, yeah, as it says, it's a laboratory simulation of Titan's nitrogen methane atmosphere. And what she was interested then would be to sort of <coughs> to sort of emulate the, uh, the um, sound transmission characteristics that this other, that another place, that another planet, that another environment. Uh, yeah, when I first met her, she was asking me like, how big is middle C on the surface of Jupiter or stuff? I think I also was trying to come up with a calculation for how big it would be in the sun. And she got really excited about that. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but uh, before we get, we did a we did a thing in Berlin back in 2012. I contacted some uh, scientist who was. Uh, I said, "Is it is the sun a liquid or a solid or what?" And then he, and he said, "Oh, it's a gas. It's gas because there's, the sun actually has less density in it than you'd think, mm -hmm. like like a cloud. It's surprising." So anyway, it, it was always fun to do stuff for her. <laughs> And then I think, I think just in terms of the images here, I have just one more little um, example, and then I just wanted to sort of give her the last word and read a series of quotations from her. But this is another one of the late unrealized proposals for what she called the Arosa, uh, which would have been a sort of pearl that one puts in one's ears. She sort of also anecdotally described them as sort of sunglasses for the ears. And she relates it to a story that's um, uh, told in... I, I, trying to think of the name of the book. It's a, it's a collection of sort of biographical writings of uh, Edwin Schrodinger. And there's a story of Schrodinger uh, and his partner spending a weekend on a lake in isolation while he was dealing with a particular mathematical problem. And his lover, to increase his concentration, inserted pearls into his ears for the duration of the weekend. And after the weekend, he came to some great realization. And so this was the sort of inspiration for these uh, pearl devices for the ears, uh, one of her late unrealized uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. And then, oh yeah, okay. How are we doing on time, by the way? Good? I think, I think we're okay. Okay. I mean, I have, I just wanted to read. Okay. Soon. I mean, yeah. Well, I thought it would be very nice, though, to give her sort of the last word and also to sort of also say that, um, you know, the sort of, conceptual framework that I was sort of vaguely uh, mapping out at the beginning, I think as we've worked through these materials and continue to work through them more and more, we start to actually also see confirmed. I mean, it's not something that we're just inventing. So I just thought that we could, I would read very quickly a, a series of quotations from the sort of decades of her working career. So first, um, from 1964, which at that time you have to imagine she's 26 years old, she's just studied with Stockhausen, and she, uh, she writes in a note to herself at that time, quote, I'm not so much interested now in producing sound as in creating a world to which the listener might go. 
And then a few years later, when she's in this sort of like a little bit more hippie phase, um, this is a really fascinating text, which we'll just read a bit out of, uh, where she really uh, talks about technology and some of the sort of accusations of techno-fetishism that would occasionally come up later in her career. She sort of takes on, in a, in a in certain way, kind of head on. So for example, in the middle, she says, electronically, I feel it's necessary spiritually to make the powerful personal. To work hard and fast, turn what might be abused as control elements, what might be used to exploit the senses, to transform this material away from control into openness. And then jumping down to the bottom, she says, the necessity to make research here requires constant work before the design of other circuits can be made. Otherwise, we are producing toys, artist-engineer collaborations, gadgetry, which will require another 50 years to bring content to. And then jumping to the um, 70s, I think. Oh no! Oh yeah, this. Oh yeah, this is the 70s. This is this is. Uh, we didn't really explain this period. It's a very. This is a very mysterious period where before she was doing the City Links, she has all these sort of scores. They're a little bit like proto Oliveros scores, but they're earlier than Oliveros. Sort of listening pieces without electronics. Um, kind of quite hippie. Um, Becoming simple, another way of sharing, another way of being alive to each other, aware of each other's sounding waves. We begin listening to each other, music actually beginning from this basis totally, rather than from another structure, maybe the first culture with this basis. And then there's that telepathic concert at the kitchen. Exactly, it's the same period. <laughs> yeah, there was a... That got reviewed, right? It did. They couldn't figure out what it was. I think Tom Johnson reviewed the concert, which had no sound, and he claimed to hear something. Um, this is then from the 80s, from a text, a wonderful short text called The Head Stretch. Um, I don't know if I should read all of this. It's a little bit longer, but... Do we perceive the sound in the room, in our heads, a great distance away? Or do we experience all three dimensions clearly at the same time? Is the sound barely audible, seeming to touch skin receptors only? The cochlea seems to feel untouched? Is the sound we perceive just enough stimuli to trigger patterns and melodies created with, within neural sensitivities shaping our deepest responses? In the room, does the sound drift, float, fall like rain? Does it make such a clear shape in the air we seem to see it in front of our eyes? Is there no sound, no music in the room at all, but we continue to hear sound as our minds process after sound from music perceived minutes ago? Uh, continues. Is the apparent sound volume larger than life? That is, is it as powerful as a gigantic sounding house? Energy circulating through many rooms and floors? Some people say they feel their bodies grow out, expand with this sound. These descriptions refer to actual results, real effects of music I have made, not simply metaphors for possible experiences. However, there's been no way to reproduce these experiences other than in performance installation situations. And then, Let's see. Oh, yeah. This is something I think we can just go through quite quickly. This is a very interesting document. I think these were working notes for a lecture she gave at Mills College around 94 when she was a guest professor there. The title of which, of course, you can see, Rethinking Notion of Peace. <laughs> um, where she's sort of explicitly, I think, doing what uh, the sort of entry that we're pointing towards at the beginning uh, that sort of problematizes the sort of standard, like, fixed notion of, of a work. Um, of course, ex immediately mentioning Cage as a sort of starting point, um, uh, away from the sort of habituation. Uh, we don't really have time to go through all this more closely. Um, how Beethoven is trashed. Um, <laughs> let's see, um, yeah, this is just a wonderful document uh, that deserves more time. And then I think as a last quote, um, I would read just one thing that's slightly, uh, just a paragraph I have on my phone here. Uh, it's a sort of slightly, this image is a beautiful image actually made in the 80s by Kathy Brew at uh, NASA, uh, one of uh, her, Amishay's friends and collaborators from the 70s uh, from MIT at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, Scott Fisher, who was a, a very important developer of the head-mounted display in virtual reality. Um, 
any case, that's just a digression about the image. Um, the, the last quote I wanted to read comes from what seems to be, and so, somewhat unfortunately, uh, her last longer text, which was written uh, as a sort of interdepartmental communication to her collaborators uh, for her unfinished work at MPAC in upstate New, in upstate New York. She was uh, meant to be doing this collaboration with the open-ended group, and the collaboration sort of was a disaster and totally fell apart. And she wrote a, a 10 to 20 page document uh, known as The Agreement, um, in which she tries to uh, explain uh, and tries to find a way to work with them. In any case, uh, there's a wonderful paragraph that I'd just like to read. It says, quote, Excuse my di uh, digression from the intended topic, but I felt it might be a good point to clarify some misunderstandings about what my compositional activity consists of when I am discovering how to construct these kinds of otherwise unknown spatial dimensions. They must be composed. They do not appear like a magician's rabbit. For me, composing involves much more than arranging sounds and simply sending them through a sophisticated multi-channel installation of loudspeakers. In my view, most personal composing usually consists of rearranging the figures and patterns of other men's music. Many algorithms are already available for that. For me, composing consists of constructing the dimensions of a unique sonic architecture, a magical world the audience may enter. Unfortunately, to produce my work, it is necessary that I use loudspeakers. However, I do not want their existence to be apparent in my composition. It is also not a matter of concealing them. Instead, I must discover actual ways of destroying their existence perceptually in order to create the kind of unique realm of immersive experience I compose. This is to say that I am not sitting in the theater throughout the night playing, quote, old CDs and dats, end quote, instead of producing new sounds. In my composing, I am attempting to create something much more sophisticated compositionally, which to my knowledge has never been fully realized before, end quote. Yeah. 